Now I would like to introduce Cam Agayan presenting the anatomy of the most challenging network engineering interview question. Cam is a member of the program committee and a director of cloud engineering at Oracle, having traveled from California to join us on stage today. This is Cam's third time presenting at Nanog, and it's a pleasure to have him speaking with us today. Welcome, Cam. Thank you, sir. Hi. It's 5 p.m. second day. It's like the worst possible time to talk about um, network engineering interview processes. Right? But uh, let's get started by something really interesting. Uh, kind of brain teaser. Have you noticed who watches all the Nanak sessions, every single minute of those, other than our director, Valerie? There is somebody else, a group of people. Our AV folks back there, this just, uh, you know, put our hands together for a second for those guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of credit to them. Uh, we have a kind of interesting relationship. Once I was about to steal one of his microphones and they caught me, I think in Washington, DC, but really, really great team back there. And I uh, appreciate that. The second thing, quick show of hands. How many people are local? Like local, real local, not New York City undercover. Oh, okay, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Cool, and uh, next question. How many people have seen my previous presentation on a similar topic, uh, the one that we delivered in Austin, 2019? You know, a few people, thank you. Cool, so let's get started. Uh, this morning, we had that session with uh, Sylvie, a really great session on Google Network, Subsea Network, and, uh, and I asked her that, like, uh, can I have like a few sentences in French so I can introduce myself and, you know, but turn out it's very difficult. But she told me, as long as you say bonjour, uh, they're gonna love you, exact sentence. So bonjour everyone, really, Great city, I appreciate your uh, hospitality and hosting us this year. So my first name is Kam, K-A-M, Director of Cloud Engineering with Oracle. And I am here to talk about um, the anatomy of the trickiest network engineering interview question. This is kind of part two to another uh, nano uh, presentation that we had, but if you have not watched the other one, it's on YouTube. You can always get a hold of it. It was an interesting talk. So let's just have a quick look back. Around two years ago, two and a half years ago, we talked about network engineering and uh, you know interview questions. Before COVID, no masks, no work from home, nothing like that. I mean, we got together in Austin, and that was the session that I presented. Back then, it was a brand new session, and Kind of new topic, uh, half controversial, you know, one of those topics. But uh, interesting thing was I got enormous feedback. Many people reached out. Still, believe it or not, two years on, people contact me with these stories. Some of the stories, you know, funny stories, some really sad, touching stories. Oh, this happened to me, that happened to me. But the interesting part, something that really, really caught my attention and was sort of my motivation to put together the second session was the stories and feedback that I got from the interviewers. People who reached out just let me know, you know what, we watched this and we made these changes. Actually, a few people had me review their changes and that was really interesting. You kind of feel like you are really making an impact here. So uh, it felt really good. That is why I decided to put together another session, but this time not so independently. So I put together a survey, worked with 26 people. These are all veteran interviewers. Um, all of them, they've done over a thousand technical interviews for large companies. And the result of survey is something that we are presenting here today. What other 
things I heard from people. Some folks want us to talk about, you know, the top question, top 10 questions, or, you know, let's just turn this into a non tutorial for hour and a half and just talk about, you know, the interview questions and process. Not really practical. So what we decided to do, not of 85 Montreal, was uh, we had a few options. I thought about the broken, the broken process, talked about the cognitive bias, you know what they are. For example, if someone is young, cannot be experienced, someone is old, cannot be a quick learner. And also, another one, the third one is an interesting one, expectation versus reality. Many messages that people send to me about their interview experience have that element in that. What it means is, most people, uh, this is this is actually kind of interesting. I have 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years experience. And I went to this job interview and did not know 60% of the questions. Well, the other thing, I think the other kind of, um, well, sad experience was, I knew the answers and he answered them all, but I felt apparently what they had in mind was not exactly the answer that I offered them. So this time around, I decided to just grab the most commonly asked question based on the survey. And I went through hundreds of interview questions, technical network engineering questions. Let's find out what that, what that question is. And then I'm going to have only 20, 25 minutes probably here. Let's analyze that question and see why does that particular question could be the most challenging question or trickiest. So that was the kind of decision, final decision, the reason I put this presentation together. Then we're going to have 30 minutes that's so going to spark some thoughts, and we're going to put our heads together. And hopefully next time, who knows, next conference or conference after, we'll get together and, uh, and uh, see what we did. So the tricky question, what really makes an, an interview question tricky? So first of all, I mean, it technically has to be a deep question. So your expectation is the candidate is not here just to you know, spell out a bunch of things that they memorized. The previous presentation, we covered that. We talked about a whole bunch of bullet points. We talked about the things that people do ask, like all the BGP attributes, and people memorize inbound and outbound policies. And uh, we don't want to do that. We covered that one. We also want to see some problem solving skills. We want to see the thought process. We want the candidate to think loud. We also want to be engaged in a conversation with the candidates. Another thing is we want to see if the candidate is able to structure the answers. It really matters to uh, many interviewers, according to the survey. And uh, this is an interesting one. The questions that are multidimensional. What are the multidimensional questions? So, when you look at this room, for example, there are a lot of components here. There are a lot of different things. You know, the chair, the podium, all these things. And the list of these things, list of these verticals, list of these pillars, list of these things, that's the horizontal view. The vertical view is when you get down and focus on one of these options, one of these items, let's take that chair and talk about the elements there, talk about the material, talk about everything that they put together and now it's called chair. So that is how we got to the last point on this slide. This is interesting, I mean, very fair question, but how many elements are out there? Let's go back to this room, as you see. Again, there are so many elements and you can talk almost forever about each one of these elements. Here's an example. Let's talk about the trip from LA to Vegas. Well, there are a lot of different ways to take that trip. Of course, you can drive yourself, you could rent, rent a car, you could drive your own car, or you know what? Someone might want to take a ride. I want to ride my bike from LA to Vegas. These are all valid options, but when you focus on one of these options, let's say the road trip, then you have the option to rent a car and then more questions are going to come up. All right, how about you know, the company, what's the best price out there? How about availability? How about insurance? Can I use my own insurance or something else? As you see, there's a tree, almost unlimited tree of questions. So, 
Well, the interviewer is going to look at you and say, what if I decide to just walk over to Vegas? That's an option. I think that's, a, that is, that's really an acceptable behavior if really he or she does that. But sometimes it does not happen. Sometimes what happens is after the interview, when they are rating you or you go through a debrief, that's the question comes up. They covered everything, right? They covered all the possible options to go from LA to Vegas, but they forgot this option is a super obvious thing. How do you not know that you could walk over? This is an old, like just kind of traditional you know, developer is the kind of question is that I have a small computer with limited memory and I want to run this giant code on it, but not so familiar to the computer engineering, um, uh, network engineering community. So, and uh, it eventually turns into a biased interviewing process. It turns into that process that the person, I mean, the interviewer is getting bored, checking time, and uh, you're not really hitting that very answer. We talked about that question. The BGP Confederation versus reflectors, that was one of the topics that we talked about in a previous presentation. That's a prime example of those. There's so many different things that when you cover, eventually someone is going to, is going to find something that you'd not cover that. We talked about this. Architecture, great. You can cover probably eight, nine items, but you're not going to talk about memory consumption. Confederation versus reflectors. And uh, that is what's going to happen. So 25 minutes later, the candidate is lost, not talking about the topic you want. At the same time, the interviewer is running out of time, still have questions to cover, and you're talking to one of the brightest candidates. This person might be your best chance. So. What is that question that we want to cover today? This is the question that came out of this survey process. You put this address, the URL, in the, in the address box, and your favorite browser, you might want to use Lynx, you might, you might want to use Google Chrome, Firefox, anything, right? And what happens, just walk me through the steps. Tell me what happens when you enter this URL in that address box. This is one of the most instant looking questions. And according to the community of 26 interviewers, uh, most people, most people they interviewed, they call their DNS. So the response to that question in most cases is the DNS. People will start on DNS, you actually have some slides on it, and forget about all the other things. But let me tell you what those other things are. So, <sighs> This is what came out of the survey. I could not find two people agree on the same answer. This is scary, isn't it? So same question, 26 interviewer, each interview thought hundreds of people, let's say over 1,000 people, so we're talking about 26,000 experiences together, and uh, they have different points of view. Interestingly, it kind of goes back to the background. When you talk to people coming from a systems engineering background, they expected, even in some cases, to hear things like the system calls. When you talk to people from network engineering background, talk to me about you know, the BHP, BGP, ASs, and all those things. So depending on the interview background, the results of the survey kind of changed. Interesting. How do you know as a candidate? How do I know as a candidate, right? I prepared myself, I spent two weeks to get ready for this call or in-person interview, and here's the experience I'm getting. Let's look at the possibilities, just some of the possibilities, just to be sure we're showing one example. Again, we're not trying to cover 10 interview questions, we're not trying to cover any question 100%, 100% but what we're trying to do is we just want to show the possible layers that exist here and you might miss. Or the interviewer might miss. As we can imagine, starts from layer one and layer two, goes all the way to the hardware and how the hardware really processes each one of these packets. Here is an example. Layer one, you know DWDM is a complex thing. And you know everything, I mean, many things probably about all the other layer one stuff, but most people do not cover anything layer one when they answer that question. 
it's not really technically a network architect's job, but how do you know? How do you know that is really not part of the answer? How do you know it is not what they mean? Layer two, smart candidate is going to cover our MAC address. Let's find out what the MAC address is. Then let's structure the packet. This is how a packet is built. This is a layer two data. Here is a source destination, the entire um, header. Uh, let's talk about the VNANs. Let's talk about the proxy or process. And you know, all this stuff, everything there, 100% valid answers. But what's left is there's a lot more. Each hop, I expect that this candidate to talk about the behavior of each one of these hops. So that's the interest, right? You're going from one router. From here, you're hopping another one, another one, another one. You did not talk about it. Layer two is not going to die. It, it exists. But you cover just your laptop, the device that you're losing its Lynx browser to put the URL in. Another interesting example, the whole routing space. So I guess the same candidate, smart candidate, is going to cover uh, the process from the computer that you put in the address. And most likely, you're going to have a default gateway. And you're going to contact default gateway through the layer 2 process. And from there, you're going to go out. So of course, there is going to be some local routing setup within your building. You might cover that. You might say, all right, my building is running OSPF or um, stub area of something else. And that's how I'm going to get out of this room. That's how I'm going to get out of this office. But look at this. All right. Uh, well, the candidate was talking about the laptop, but I really meant a router. And a router had a very specific route. And that route might have been pointing to the NATIC address. That's a different routing decision than the default route. How do you know I have a default route? You never ask a question. Now you see the problem here. The expectation is you ask clarification questions and you find out where this URL is entered, what kind of station is requesting that web page. And the interviewer is sitting there and expecting you to cover slash no that part of the answer. You are making assumptions. And those assumptions not exactly what he or she has in mind. Another example. Again, you are trying to route your traffic out of your network, and your answer is perfectly right. But guess what? My candidate did not talk about the convergence process. How do you know the network wasn't going through convergence? How do you know the network wasn't going through congestion? Encapsulation is another one. You made assumption that there is no encapsulation, nothing going on. Guess what? I expected him or her to talk about an IPsec tunnel, SSL tunnel, kind of VPN tunnel on this laptop when you put in the command. That's a possibility. Forgot to talk about that possibility. Just made assumption that I'm running this command absolutely natively. And natively, that's right, but now I had IPsec, and I forgot to cover IPsec or any kind of VPN that I was running on my laptop, or I could have been running on my laptop. BGP, same thing. Again, a smart candidate is going to cover all that for you. I'm going to talk about a port number. I'm going to talk about all these stuff, ASs, all these circuits, double decision process. Even I'm going to cover the uh, two byte versus four byte, how the AS updates are sent, and the whole story with that uh, you know, AS number. But here is a problem. There's a lot more than just native VGP routing. How do you know your service provider and running NPLS in the background for internet? Is it possible? So these are all different possibilities that eventually to disconnect between the interviewer and interview. And these are really interesting cases, especially when you look at the, again, going back to that RAT reflector versus RAT versus BGP configuration design. There's so many possibilities out there. With RAT reflectors, 
of course, I mean, uh, there, there's a lot to cover, including the memory optimization that we talked about, and most people um, kind of skip that part. But configurations also could have raster effectors. But guess what? Even in PLS network, you can have uh, raster effectors. I actually have a session I presented a few years ago. We're talking about IPv6, connecting IPv6 islands using MPLS and service provider backbone. And these are all possibilities that fair game. So, yeah, I meant it, and he or she never covered those. At least they could have asked. But how do I know that I need to ask all those questions about each one of the steps? As you notice, now that we have this horizontal view, now you look at each one of the towers, possibilities are endless. And interrupting the interviewer, asking questions at each one of the steps, at least would make me feel uncomfortable. I don't want to you know, ask the 25 questions to answer one question. But this is exactly where we're headed. Another interesting thing, there is so much more when you talk about routing. And these are all the things that people mention. The candidates covered routing. I absolutely loved it. It was perfect coverage, right? But assumption was I had no ECMP going on. I had no load sharing going on. I had no hashing algorithm going on. Uh, did not talk about really you know, how different routers handle different kinds of traffic. And it's important. These things are important. And interestingly, uh, at least in two cases, as far as I remember, People mentioned that they use the depth of information provided here to determine the level of a candidate. So if your hiring engineer covers this much, for a principal level, let's go all the way down. Oh, yeah, he or she saw all these things. And you were talking about every single detail. But keep in mind, it's almost impossible to cover all these things. It's just the small list of possibilities here. So if you are just leveling your candidates based on the amount of information presented here, it is endless. So DNS, interesting thing. That's probably how this whole question is born because that's how people cover that, right? Everybody knows about the DNS hierarchical model. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about my device. I will go to my resolver, no, do you know or do you not know? Depending on that, we're going to make a decision. And you can just jump up, ask question, one level down, one level down, one level down, eventually hit the right DNS server, get the answer, and we're done. That's how it works. Now, let's see what's hidden there. These are just four answers, four short answers out of the survey. Interesting, right? Most people make assumption that there are three root DNS servers out there. One interview told me that that's the wrong answer. Uh, well, there are three DNS roots out there, plural, right? Roots out there, but these are, they're not th 13 servers. They're not 13 DNS servers, they're more than 13. Some of them are clustered or some other designs. 13 servers mean 13 computers. That's, 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 that's a wrong statement. Next one, the candidate answered the question, the answer was perfect. But these days, at least, let's say past two or three years, many, many service providers, cloud providers, hyperscalers, they do DNSSEC to make sure that the, the, the integrity of your packet responses are preserved. Uh, I did not cover that at all. Uh, that's important. Another interesting thing, the whole GSO video here, Cloud-based, on-prem, Canada did not cover that either. How do you know my network or their network, or whoever's network, is not using GSLB? Uh, that is a possibility that they should have talked about it. They did not. And local files. How many people here know what LMOS, LM host file is? We remember what that is or was. Back in the days, there was the Wind server yeah, and some people would use that file, pretty similar to host file. As an exist no more, I guess, but yeah, possibility. We should have covered, you know, host file now, the local files that help the name resolution process. 
also on local cash. How much detail do you need about local cash? Candidate did not cover any of those. And uh, that was an interesting one. One of the favorite topics that my candidates talked about DNS, and when I asked them about the port number, so DNS port UDP 53 is one answer, sometimes TCP. I mean, we have zone transfers, right? Um, I guess, as you see, it's rat hole. Really, there's no end to this conversation. If you want to push it, and the candidate does not know exactly what you mean or where you're going, could be absolutely confusing. And interesting thing, people with systems engineering background gave me some really, really interesting answers. So uh, one of them is expecting a candidate to uh, run the um, some kind of tracing command or Linux box and know the uh, system calls. I guess that's kind of not fair for network engineering interviews, but uh, how do you know about the operating system? You're making assumptions. You're making assumption that it's a Windows operating system. Uh, could have been something else. And security had its own whole chapter of topics. Different access lists, different filters, all different things. The candidate did not cover any of those, just made assumption that is a wide open network and packets are traversing from left to right. And that's how we got to nanic.org, and that's why you have the page here. No, there are a lot of security devices here. Did not talk about the inspection process. And uh, I guess just to summarize this, some interesting uh, feedback for us, really for us, for whoever is interviewing people, we got to be fair. Once I caught myself many years ago, not recently, many years ago, we were hiring an enterprise network engineer. And halfway through the interview, I caught myself asking uh, inter VPN option B questions. I mean, did you have a POS? No, we did not. What were you asking? What are you exactly expecting to get out of that? Back then, right, my thought process was if he knows that, he knows, definitely knows my stuff. So I'm going to cover that thing, that like uh, far, far thing on the horizon. And I'm making an assumption that he knows that. He must know this one. This is more basic. This is wrong interview approach. I decided to stop doing that. Another thing was the um, feedback process and the constant communication between the interviewer and the interviewee. It's really key. If the interviewer, if you are interviewing someone and you feel the candidate is not on the right track, you are not putting the candidate on the right track. You're putting the interview on the right track. And penalties, losing points, it's an absolute bad approach. You ought to ask a question. Whether your question is clear enough for a candidate to answer, or it's absolutely fair to have some ambiguity and see how the candidate deal with it. But at the end of the day, it's your interview. And you have to make sure that the candidate is on the right track and is answering your questions. And let's avoid the guess what I'm thinking of model. Uh, we had that in the previous presentation. And uh, we covered that. That's absolutely not fair. So this was just one of those examples. What came out of the survey that I conducted based on feedback I got from the previous NANOP presentation. And uh, I personally liked it. I actually started using many of these lessons. Uh, and I hope uh, everybody else finds it informative. Thank you so much for, again, being here, paying attention to this session. I know it's. Uh, 5.30 p.m. almost. So really appreciate everyone's attention. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Cam, for the presentation. Um, we'll take any questions. We have about a minute. Anyone from the live audience that wants to ask? Name and affiliation, please. Still at air, still internet too. Um, based on your slides as a security engineer, I do have to ask, why does your router have a web browser on it? You know, these days it's absolutely wrong practice, but you know, these days it's possible to even run an operating system on a router, yes. a whole different operating system. But yeah. as a security engineer. Actually, somebody else asked the same question and you're right. You're right. Oh yeah, totally. I agree with you. I go to you. 
Yep. So, I mean, one of the big things you focused on was how multidimensional questions can get just way off in the weeds and unconscious bias. Absolutely, yes. What about if you're interviewing on a, you know, a role where you want to see how deeply they can troubleshoot or you want to know how they think laterally? How do you get both that problem-solving ethos without the gotcha type you know, thing you warned about? Yeah, I'd say, let me do my best to answer that question, right? Because we had that problem too. And uh, the way we answer that question, I may or may not work for you, but I will give you the answer. Uh, we do homework. So we do, we give a candidate a scenario. You take the scenario home, study that scenario, build something, you come on. Someone's gonna join that call, interview number one. We're gonna do a break, quick break and fix. We're gonna ask questions, we're gonna do a break and fix. Hands on troubleshooting, we will see how it works. Some people like it, some people do not like it, but that is probably the, I guess, fairest way. Uh, it's mutual, right? For us to see how hands on you are, and for you to show your hands-on skills. Uh, and the best results, again, go to the candidates with uh, a lot of hands-on experience, especially people starting for certifications, those things, absolutely hands-on. A bunch of show commands, troubleshooting, capture this, filter that, here's the result, that's, how, that's why it's broken, this is how we fix it. But uh, not super useful for sales engineers, for consulting engineers, for not so hands-on, mostly whiteboard people. For that kind of interview, I can, I can see a smile for that kind of interview. Yeah, we still do whiteboard and you gotta structure the interview in a you know, useful way. We used to use paper, for example, output of BGP show commands, right? And uh, it would change some lines and some stuff in that. This is a broken network. Um, that works, that worked too. But I personally like, like the live troubleshooting sessions better. Okay, well, we're and I'm not the and I'm not the candidate. So the fact that I like it, I'm sitting on the other side of the table. No, oh, sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> you are okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Four minutes over. Please feel free to reach out. Twitter, LinkedIn, always accept connections. I would love to talk. I would love to hear your experience, and. Uh, let me know. Let me know if this helps and let me know what else you'd like to know. I do have access to a range of people. We can do surveys and we can put our heads together, see how we can improve this process. I really appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you again for your presentation, Cam.